Madonna. So I wrote a story, and I'm going to tell you about my story. So, me and my browser. So this is me, I'm a web developer, I write code for work, that's what I get paid to do. And sometimes I feed that to a thing called browser, that's the box, uh, and then comes up as a awesome sauce. Um, so when I started, I was like, yes, this is really interesting. So I learned so many other tools, like jQuery and React, and then I feed that to browser, and then browser replies me back, like, awesome web application, you know? And then I got, like, used to it. So, like, I'm gonna learn more libraries. I added, on top of jQuery and React, D3, right? I fed them. And then suddenly, browser became unhappy. <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> but I was told that I need to learn my, you know, tools. So I added TypeScript and Bubble to my tool bait, and I sent it to a browser once again. And you know, it's not quite unhappy, but it's like junky as hell. <laughs> so at this point, I'm like, I don't like browser. Like I don't know about you. Why are you keeping distance from me? <laughs> I just wanted to be friend with you. Like, the beginning, I really liked hanging out with you. It was awesome. You know, you write HTML, put it into browser, don't even need a server, something moves, amazing. So I started to realize, maybe it's me. It's me that's outside of the browser who is not understanding, and maybe what I need to do is to understand what is inside. So when I was a kid, uh, so I grew up in Japan, there's a thing called paper theater or kamishibai, which is exactly this. You get a stack of paper ordered, there's a story on the back, there's gonna be the picture, and then you work through. And, you know, these are the things that you would get at, I don't know, communal events or library. You know, one of those uh, days that somebody leaves the book for you, instead of the book, it might be the box. And I used to love it, both performing and being the audience. Because the stories that they tell inside of that paper theater box is like classic. Like, the stories that everybody knows, the stories that are many different um, paper, sorry, the, the, the picture books are written for kids, but the people who is producing the deck set for paper theater intimately understood that the nature of this simple sliding box. And sometimes on the back of the card, they have kind of like a direction of how to perform them. It says slide halfway, do this part, and then slide it out. So they knew the environment and they knew the stage and they fed the content that is best suited for the job. If you can switch to the slides. So, um, this was me. Hello, JSCon. Uh, it's been amazing to be back. I spoke three years ago. When I spoke three years ago, this was me. I was still beginning of my journey into doing this development thing for work. I always worked in tech, but not getting paid writing code, so I was trying to figure this out. And this is maybe me now-ish. Uh, the difference is that I now care about my config files. Uh, I care about what goes into my build pipeline, but I don't really mm, consider myself as a, like an expert web developer, but since the three years ago when I spoke, I got, you know, two new job, I guess. And, you know, so I feel like confident that I am progressing and I am employable and I am doing this for work. Uh, speaking of work, beginning of this year, I was assigned to a project with three other engineers who I consider all of them advanced than me. Uh, 
They were the one who is writing a UI framework. They were the one who is writing spec for service workers and CSS. They knew their craft. And you can imagine my intimidation of writing a first pull request to them, being under microscope of the person who wrote Preact and you were writing UI. Um, so I felt this like divide a bit between them and me, not of the personal divide, but just the knowledge and the level of conversation that they were having. That if you go to team meeting, that the level of conversation that they were having is that like, oh, I don't want to use that CSS because it doesn't transform, whatever that means. Um, I don't really like, like this API because it doesn't use a compositor, whatever that means. Uh, they're going to debate on like whether to do the event delegation or bubbling. I'm like, either way. Um, <laughs> So I felt like they knew the behind the scenes of browser and they are making sophisticated choice. So I decided it's time to join them, going back on that the other side and then investigate what the heck is going on inside of the browser. So this talk, I changed the talk title from the abstract. So this is a how to be a web master inside of look at modern web browser. And I called it how to be a master because I consider the, the person master or craftsman to be the person who intimately knows their tools in order to do their job. Um, there is a lot of registered traditional masters in Japan and all of them, like I love watching those documentaries, all of them intimately knows the craft and their tools. So my intent was that it, by understanding the tool of my job browser, try to be a web master. Um, in order to go into how browser internals, I need to cover a few of the computer concepts before going into it, because I promised the organizers that this talk will be uh, no, uh, no requirement for previous knowledge. So, a few concepts that I want to talk about before going into it. And then, fair warning, I am making very, very, very generalization of these concepts. If you disagree with me, Please tell me how you think so at the pool side tomorrow. Um, so the first thing is a CPU, sometimes called central processing unit. CPU is a hardware on your computer that is really good at doing a lot of computational tasks. They can handle a lot of things, but they can they do it one by one as the tasks come in. Um, the modern computer's case, it is there that you only have one core, the worker for CPU. You usually have a few of them on your computer, so they're doing even more work altogether. Another concept is a GPU, graphics processing unit. GPU also does computations and can perform and there's a core, but GPU contrary to CPU is really good at doing simple tasks all at once with many, many, many more cores. So as the name suggests, um, they were um, primarily started to be used by graphics card and then putting the graphics on the computer. Imagine turning on and off the million bits of the pixels on the computer, but they're gaining a lot more computational power. So accelerated GPU computing, um, they can do a little more math basically to do so, but they do it fast altogether. So you might see the machine or the computer hardware, the CPU and GPU lives, and your application, not just web application, lives on top of that. And CPU and GPU is handling whatever the logic that you put into the application. Well, not quite. Uh, in between your application and machine hardware, there is usually a operating system that is kind of facilitating communications between them. So in Chrome's case, uh, to, in order to put a graphics on the screen, Chrome publishes a OpenGL command that sometimes on some other platform just directly fed into, but on Windows that goes through a conversion phase to convert it into DirectX, I think, uh, that is more suited for a graphics on Windows. So another concept that I want to talk about is a process and threads. And I apologize in advance, uh, a fairly abstract visualization controlling to CPU and GPU. Uh, but like process and threads are already abstract concept if you look at from hardware point of view. And on top of that, like it doesn't make any sense to process. 
what's process visualized? Like threads, like a lot of people write uh, like a little threads on the screen, but like, I don't know, to me it didn't click. So just imagine the process is a unit on CPU that is running your applications and the thread lives inside of the process and thread is the one actually executing that code for the process. So if you start a, any application, the windows open up, behind the scenes of that UI is that CPU starts a process, process use memory, so whatever you do on the application that gets saved into memory in the meantime of you running the application. And if you close that application, process goes away, memory gets free, and then ready for all operations. The process can also start a, another process to kind of like divide the work focus. So they start, they use different location of the memory and they work together by communicating thing called inter-process communication or sometimes say IPC. And good thing about this is that if one of the process gets hung up with something, the bug or something, and then just becomes unresponsible, then you just close it and then the original process still lives. So your application might as well still be running with a few broken bits of UI while that other process comes back up. So what's the browser's process and threads look like? So one browser might look like this, the one giant process and many threads inside. Or it might look like this with a few other processes and few threads inside of them. Or it might look like this, many, many more processes and kind of like a divided work. Uh, in fact, this is where Chrome's architecture is moving towards now. The idea is that each of the tasks are service so that uh, if you are running Chrome on a low powered device, remember process takes up memory, um, they can consolidate them so that there is a less process to provide the experience. But if you are on Mac or something that is powerful, then they can spin up more processes to do a better efficient work. So for the purpose of the talk, I'm going to talk about a this model, which is mm, current, maybe near past architecture of Chrome, which is one browser process that's at the top that kicks off few multiple of render process. Uh, they also kicks a plugin process, GPU, and then of course utility. Um, I am, oops, it's important to uh, mention that this is a, this is a um, implementation detail. There is no spec how to write a web browser. There is a spec for HTML and CSS, but there is no spec for how many processes the browser should use. So Firefox might be different, Edge might be different, Safari might be different. Uh, I am only choosing this model because I work for them. Uh, so it was a lot easier to answer questions if I had them. Um, so. Looking at this, it's very abstract. So let's put it into what you can see in visual. So imagine your regular old web browser. Um, this part, everything outside of the content that you provide is called, sometimes called Chrome of the application, where I believe where name Chrome come from. Um, that's browser process responsibility. They have UI threads that controls UI. They have network threads to get data from network. And then the part that your code runs, web content or the tab, is render process uh, responsibility. If inside of them have a plugin, say Flash, then that is controlled by plugin process. And then on top of that, everything visually happening, both a, the Chrome part of the application and the web content part of the application is helped and powered by GPU process. Cool? Yeah? Huh? Okay. So I mentioned that the multiple lender processes for Chrome. So what does that look like? Well, in simple term, it means that each tab that you open gets one process, 
with main thread and worker thread and you know things that you might heard from Maltu and Chris talk. So separating these processes into each tab gets a little good, good benefit for this. Like, you know, the no two, tab, uh, two tabs don't share a memory, so there is no fear of leaking. Uh, and then if, you know, one tab gets unresponsible, um, some bug, memory leak, whatever, and then just, you know, completely shuts off, you just close them and other uh, tabs still works, right? Um, I kind of like roughly mentioned that one tab per process, but if you have many, many tabs like I do, uh, Chrome uh, kind of starts to reassigning different uh, sites into the same processes. So there is, depending on the kind of resource that your hardware have, uh, there is a smart uh, threshold of how many render processes that they are going to spin up. This is the reason why if you have 100 tabs and then you kill one tab because it was unresponsible, all of a sudden 50 other tabs die, right? So if all of the tabs were run by one process, render process and many threads, then if one of them gets busy or unresponsible, then you have to kill them all and you have to close the browser, that's sad. So that's the uh, idea of multiple process for rendering. So let's, we, now we covered a, how process works underneath, let's cover how those processes communicate in order to display whatever the code that you give it to browser. So today, uh, we're gonna look at a very simple case of loading some website, uh, loading content, downloading image, and then a little bit of scrolling. So, I talked about that the top part of the browser is controlled by lender process. So, uh, sorry, browser process. Browser process have a few different threads, like UI threads that controls all of the UI bits, a network thread that goes out to get the data from the network, and then store, uh, storage thread, basically access to file access, right? And then I'm sure there's many more. So when you are typing things into that Omnibox, that's browser process responsibility because that's UI. And UI thread looks at that input saying like, is this search query or URL? Because in Chrome, you can either put a search query and go to a search engine or you can request a website. And in this case, it looks like website. So it's a URL. UI thread calls up a network thread saying like, hey, so this navigation is about to start. Can you go get the site? And then network says, I think, you know, I logged that. So they go out and get the data. By the way, this part is the very commonly known software engineering interview question of what, the, what happens when you uh, type google.com into a browser, you know, go through to like a host name and DNS and everything. I am skipping all of that. Uh, just, you know, magically handled by network thread. And then when a little bit of data comes back, maybe a server responds with a server redirect. So network thread says to UI, hey, this you know, server says to redirect, and then UI thread returns same thing. I was like, okay, then navigate to that redirect then. But um, if the actual content start to come back, the network process kind of sniff the beginning of the file by mime type sniffing to make sure the file that they say they are is the file they are. Um, and you know, in case they are getting image file, then you don't, they don't need to render the page. It is a download request. So they would pass it on to a storage uh, thread, I'm sure. And this is where a safe browsing check happens. So I'm sure you might have seen the, if you access one, um, some site, and then Chrome suddenly says, uh, this might be phishing. Uh, you might not wanna click through. This is where the check happens. Like if it is much to the known malicious content, and then the error message is thrown. But in this case, it looks legit. So the network thread says, I got what you requested. And browser process returns, like, let me get render process. Remember, um, the content, web content, and the Chrome is a different process. So then, at this point, a UI thread might update to, like, secure um, UI shows up. And then uh, your back and forward button navigation gets committed. The lender process wake up. UI thread says, into process communication, hey, please render this page. And then the process says, okay, get me that HTML. They talk to network thread, and the network thread forwards the uh, stream of 
HTML into your render process. Render takes all of that, do its magic, which we will get into, and then returns the event saying, hey, page has loaded. At this point, the spinner stops spinning, and then from browser's point of view, navigation is complete. You have the site. At this point, if you decide to type in other uh, URL, because us JavaScript developers can define a uh, unload uh, handler, event handler, um, somebody types new site. Again, browser UI threads wakes up and saying like, hey, did you wanna handle this event? And then lender process looks at it and then like, huh, I might have the event handler for that. And then, you know, they might block that navigation or they proceed with the navigation. What gets tricky is a introduction of service worker. So service worker is a way to write a caching and uh, a network proxy from your front end code. So you write JavaScript to define which kind of resource needs to go to cache, uh, needs to go out from the network, and you write your code and then you ship it with your application. This is your JavaScript, which means it lives on the lender process. But the navigation is handled by browser process. So the, when site is requested, browser process or the UI thread checks for known service worker scope. So the browser process have a reference to a known installed scope, basically a domain of the site, and then checks for it. And then now you see, oh, there is a, it is a scope that a service worker is installed. So in this case, browser process have to wake up the lender process asking, hey, you need to run your service worker code. And lender process do that. And then turns out lender process wanted to get a fresh content back. So they say, actually, let me, like, please give me that resource from the freshly network. And UI thread says, here you go, get that to your network process. You might see this round trip is unnecessarily, like, possibly making it slow. And this is the reason why sometimes you see article about like service worker startup time problem. Um, there is a proposed, well, there is a, a new feature that is coming into browser called navigation preload, which basically um, starting the network request while uh, they're checking with service worker. My teammate, Jake Archibald, wrote a, a great introduction and a how-to article. So if you're curious, check that out. So. Now, moving on to lender process. Uh, where we, lender process have a worker threads that you might heard of from the beginning of the talk before me. Uh, they also have compositor thread and last year thread that we will go uh, to get into. But the main, um, oh, I need to first just say that this part is where, when people talk about uh, website performance goes in. So there's so many details, in-depth knowledge, many, many, many articles, even within uh, my team's own documentation site, there is like hundreds of them. So if you're curious of any of that bit, I recommend you to go check that out. And just to make sure that I'm not just plugging my team, uh, Mozilla has really great blog posts, especially with the release of server Servo and the WebLender, their new engine, um, especially Len Clark has been writing a lot of great uh, explanation. WebKit blog, in between their release notes, they also write amazing documentation about how internal browser works. So if you're curious about any of this from this talk, I highly recommend to check that out. So, lender process. Last time we talked about, you know, the feed coming in, but the, Lender process, especially main thread's job, is to get the data and turn them into something that's displayable on the screen. So, how does that work? The first step is loading and parsing. Uh, as you saw, they start receiving a stream and they start leading them from the top to the bottom. And then if the browser, uh, the um, main thread sees that the link or image or script that needs to get out to get it, they send a request to network thread in browser process to get it. But uh, result of this process parsing is a DOM tree that we all know. Uh, this is a browser's internal representation of the site as well as a API and a representation that us JavaScript developer interact with via JavaScript. So, uh, in this process, if a, thre a main thread sees a JavaScript, then they need to pause 
the parsing, and then they need to get the JavaScript, download them, parse them, execute them, and then once everything is done, they can go back to the rest of HTML because JavaScript can modify DOM. So you, you know, it might do uh, a little bit of HTML and you're feeling good, and then like uh, JavaScript comes in and document .light everything. That's a possibility, so they need to stop. Um, that's, this is why a lot of uh, like a kind of word of wisdom about like put the JavaScript at the bottom comes from. And then, you know, modern browsers or modern web APIs have been introducing a lot of ways to hint to the browser how to load, uh, treat those things. So if you are sure that your JavaScript code is not going to interact with DOM, then you can put async attribute because that's not gonna block a render. Uh, if you're curious about those resource priority, uh, my teammate wrote a blog post on the same site that I've been showing. <laughs> so now that the DOM is there, the only DOM is not gonna construct a website, they need style. So they lead the CSS, and then they calculate what's called a computed style. It's basically a matching of what kind of CSS is applied to this one given DOM node. Um, you can see those, in a dev tools, uh, you see, oops, you see their computed part, that's what you are seeing, the computed style. And once that's done, is it possible to render the page? Not really, I mean, I'm looking at it, there is a paper, on top of that paper, there's a phone. I can't really describe how it is a place or what uh, it is, so they need to figure out layout, the geometry of the page. So. The main thread goes through, like, you know, oh, and the layout is tricky. Like, even with a simple website like this, they need to figure out where the line break is going to be, and if they line break on that point, then the top of the box expands, which means the subsequent box all moves down. So there is a um, vertical writing on the CSS, there is a float and flex, and layout is quite a complicated task. But they work through that, and then creates what's called layout tree. It's important to note that layout tree is not equal to DOM tree. Uh, sometimes it looks like it's the same, but uh, layout only cares about the things that's going to be on the screen. So they uh, omit the things like display none, and they add things that's not in the DOM, like uh, pseudo uh, content from CSS. So then it's time to paint. Because we have geometry and what's in them and style of them, you might think that you can paint, uh, draw the picture already, but if I'm having this like human fax machine game with like Suze, who's my friend sitting in front of me, I can't, still can't really um, explain what exactly I am seeing in front of me because of the index and all of the complicated CSS stuff. So if I go through this by DOM order, then I would paint a header and then next is div, and then next is another div. But then, there's a z-index, so this is totally messed up. So they need to figure out what, exactly how to paint the page, and that process is called paint. They go through the layout tree, and then create what's called paint records. And it's kind of like, if you looked at, uh, used a canvas API, then it's similar to that, you just like have a, do this, do that, do this to recreate the page. It's really important to note that in each steps, the input is from the previous step. So if you mess something up in the middle of this pixel pipeline, then all of the subsequent um, trees and data structures needs to be regenerated. Um, if it's like at the end of it, maybe it's okay, but if you do it deep in the rendering process, then you know, there's a lot of computation to be done. And if you are doing this kind of thing for your animation, say, then you know, you're in problem because our display refreshes 60, 60 times a second. So you need to make sure that all of the calculation is catching up to that cadence. So you might be feeling good, but then, oh, you missed a frame and page junks. Or, you know, you might be feeling good, you have like a tiny changes going in, but then keep in mind, this is main thread. So it's also handling your JavaScript code and your JavaScript code will start to throw a heavy computation thing and then you miss a frame and page junks. Uh, there is a way to get that timing 
by calling request animation frame. And there's a way to like divide your heavy JavaScript task so that it doesn't block rendering. There is heavily documented on optimizing JavaScript execution documentation. So now that we have all of the draw orders and everything, maybe it's time to draw or rasterize the page. How would you do that? Well, you might go through naive way of like, okay, I know the viewport, I know the layout, I know how to paint those layout, so I'm gonna lay them out. If the person scrolls, then I'm gonna fill in the list. And uh, if the UI moves, like, you know, the um, menu bar slides in or something, I'm gonna invalidate that change to part and then redraw them again. But you can see this gets kind of like, a lot of work if you're trying to do it 60 frames per second. So modern browser have a way to do this a little more um, uh, efficiently called a composite. So the idea of a composite is that they're going to divide all of your elements into layers like Photoshop layers and they raster them all uh, together. That's why it's already a rasterized image, so all the browser has to do is moving and layering them. So changing the scrolling doesn't matter, moving the things that is already in one layer doesn't matter, works smoothly. So here's a video of, a, you can check this uh, layer on your dev tool. So here's a video of application that I made, which is visualizing your image input as a knit fabric. Uh, you can see there's a two layers as I move them. You can see that layer box is moving. I am going to soon turn on the paint flashing, which basically is a hint to see, to see which part of the region of the page is painted. Oh, it's just, um, <laughs> it's just a green paint happened, so there might be some kind of performance problem that I have, but you can see I move all of my pictures and no paint is happening. It's already last rise and it's just moving. So that's the composite. In order to do this, uh, the uh, browser goes through a layout tree to create a layer tree. And once that layer tree uh, is created, they can composite. And uh, sometimes you might find parts of your application that you think is a layer might not get layer. In that case, you can hint to the browser, hey, this will change, and then they create a layer for you called will change. And it's tempting to layer all the things because it's gonna be pre and it's just moving them, but that might result in a, another performance junk. So it's always important to measure your performance, runtime performance, um, before deciding how to use those attributes. So now that all of the trees and the paint order is in, main thread calls up a compositor thread, which is specialized to handling this compositing. They commit that data and say, go display this page. So then, Compositor thread, try to raster the page. But as you can see, the page is now bigger. It's not just viewport. So they have a mechanism to divide that up into tile. And each of the tile is rasterized using raster thread. What the raster thread is doing is that getting the small quad of the page, making it into a, a GPU texture map and put it into GPU memory, also keeping the reference in a a compositor thread. So compositor thread also have a idea of where the viewport is, so they might schedule um, the, the around the viewport earlier than the one on the bottom, so they are a little more sophisticated. But now you have all of the draw quads, compositor thread, composite the page, and then creates what's called a compositor frame. This is the frame of your application that you're showing. This one gets sent to a browser process, your IPC saying render this and browser process UI process might add another composite frame you know to display that UI part of the thing and then send it to GPU if the scroll comes in remember the scroll input comes in then UI thread says hey there is input compositor thread goes no problem I know how to layer these things so they create another compositor frame send it to GPU and you know, small scrolling, because the most important part is that a compositor thread could handle all of this. They didn't need to bother a main thread, they didn't junk the page. So, but sometimes you might have this kind of application where you want to like, you know, clip the only horizontal scroll to one region and you might add other event listener and then prevent default and then kind of trying to force the scroll. 
Well, that event handler lives in the main thread in JavaScript, so how does that handle? So compositor thread, um, when they're uh, last raising and compositing them, they mark that part as a known fast scalable region, which basically means that if any event happens on this point, then tell me, and then I need to ask uh, main thread. Pause the scroll, they say, hey, do you need something? And main thread might say, yeah, there is an event handler, so I'm gonna block that default move, right? But there is a common technique in JavaScript, which is event delegation. You put a one event listener on the top or the big region of it, and then you check which of the target it is. In this case, it's a problem. Everything becomes a non-fast scrollable region. And compositor thread is basically just dispatching the message to main thread, like, do you need it? Like, even though main thread actually didn't need those part, they need to ask to them. So, as a web developer, Oh, just a piece of junk. So as a web developer, we can put a passive true um, options, and that makes it a legion um, not red. Basically what it means is that I still wanna hear about the event on the main thread, but you can go ahead and start scrolling if um, you want to. And uh, there is a CSS attribute like touch action panix, which basically you don't need to write any um, JavaScript logic to prevent default and then clip it to whatever the gesture that you want. You just write a CSS and browser takes care for you. So those things also documented on our site if you wanna check that out. So hopefully this didn't overwhelm you with like, holy shoot. <laughs> So many things I need to know. Well, there is a little bit of tools to help you uh, when you're trying to develop. So one is Lighthouse. Lighthouse is a plugin, also a tool that lives within the Chrome developer tool. Uh, if you go open the audits tab, uh, they run the audit of your site and then tells you the score. And a lot of people care about the score and getting 100. But what I find more interesting is a explanation of each audit. And uh, when I started at this team at uh, Chrome Developer Relations, uh, first thing I did was going through all of the audit to learn what browser cares about as a performance or any other um, business area. Other thing that's coming to web platform is a feature policy. So feature policy is like a content security policy but for your feature. So you put a little bit of a, a snippet in your header, then it will block the feature. So you might have things like fast animation feature policy where every CSS animation that is not performant is blocked. There is a feature policy, demos.apps.com, um, that has all of the um, try and error type of thing. And this is super, this is very new, and it's really interesting to see what kind of feature policy is proposed, because it tells what kind of performance problem, what kind of feature problem that the web developer and browser engineers are having. So, hopefully, uh, through this, you might thought that, oh, I already knew that. You are on the behind the side of the browser. I was the front side. Um, if you're like me, who's like, this is interesting, but I don't know where to start, I recommend just building applications. Uh, it doesn't have to be to do MZC, it doesn't have to be Hacker News clone, you can pick whatever the thing you want to do. I like knitting, so for three years since last JSConf, I made more than five, I'm sure I'm forgetting, uh, uh, knitting related application, which all of them have idea of compilers, uh, bit operations, uh, UI, transform, uh, smooth scrolling, all of it. And like by the time the fifth one, Netherify, this is the only one that I can proudly say to my friend, hey, use this application, it's actually kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> so it takes time, it's really frustrating, but I highly recommend learning them. And if you didn't get anything from it, I hope, this image of cute threads are now engraved into your brain and you think about them every time you open a browser. This has been me, Mariko, that's my Twitter handle. This slide is super animation heavy. I am planning on publishing static version later and 
all of the reference. I mean, I counted this morning, I had a 48 tabs of resources to list. So those will be coming soon. If you took any of the pictures or you wanna use the slides later, uh, I consider all of my drawing to be CC by NCSA 4.0, whatever that was, I forgot. I decided that was the license I'm going to use. <laughs> um, so if you use them in your talk or education or blog or whatever, do let me know, but please uh, use away. Thank you very much. <laughs>